this one with us. <laughs> oh, the Father, I know there are folks in our church that need our prayers. 
uh, those who are dealing with some of the struggles uh, in this life, uh, some who are having fiscal issues, some who are having surgery, uh, Lord, even those who are dealing with the COVID-19. Lord, would you help us to be wise as well? And uh, Lord, I pray for protection. Protection upon each of us in this room, protection upon our church. And uh, Lord, I want to thank you that just adding up today and staff that, that appears that we have four families, maybe as many as six families that will be coming to make this their home on Sunday. God, I thank you for that. I thank you for how that you're blessing, even in the midst of time, that we're having to, to kind of rearrange. I want to thank you for senior adults who have been very understanding and very cooperative during this time of adjustments and change. And Lord, every church can't say that. I thank you and I praise you. And I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now before uh, Brother Bill comes, as he's coming, let me say one thing to you. I was telling them at lunch or supper tonight, a bunch of us went and had supper together to staff. Uh, as you know, I serve as chairman of the executive committee for our Georgia Baptist Convention, which means that is literally the highest office in our Georgia Baptist Convention. Now we have no hierarchy in our state convention, but let's tell you that we're autonomous in our local church. But one of the young men that uh, is serving on the budget team with us came up to me yesterday. He said, Brother Tom, I need your help. So I tell him, Brother Phil, but he said, I need you. I said, what? He said, man, he said, I got a group of senior adults that's about to drive me crazy. <laughs> he said, I got to have help. He said, you need to help me. And uh, he then began to tell me all the story, and I was telling Bill about it. And so at uh, first, I, I was playing with him. I said, let me tell you what you do. You go and you put your foot down, and you say, and then I said, no, 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 don't do that. I said, they're old enough to be here, because he's like 35. <laughs> and I said, no, don't do that. Don't do that. But I, I want to thank you that you haven't been that way. And, and isn't that amazing? Or you all give yourself a good round of applause. But you've been willing to make adjustments and not been one of those who've been upset and frustrated. So I love you. God bless you. It's good to have some of you back. Is, is your wife okay? Is Miss Shirley okay? Doing good. Good, okay? All right. Everybody else good? All right, Brother Bill. I know I went over time. Brother Larry's the one that's going to hurt me. I'm sorry. I'm leaving now. Let me get my music. Oh, we are delighted that you're here tonight. If y'all would like to move around, there's some tables over here and it won't bother anybody or you find where you are, that's fine too. We are blessed tonight to have Brother Larry come and bring the, the lesson. You're helping, you're helping. By the way, he wants to be called Pope Tommy. <laughs> But we are delighted tonight to have Brother Larry come and uh, to give the lesson tonight. It is a, just a great lesson. Uh, it's on giving our treasures to the Lord. You know, for the last three weeks or the last two weeks, and then this will be the third week, we've been talking about stewardship and uh, how that our stewardship to the Lord uh, needs to be our very best. And uh, Brother Larry's going to come and he's going to share that with you tonight. Brother Larry. Ladies and gentlemen, Larry Seegers. <laughs> Somebody asked me what I was going to teach. I said, yeah, I'm going to make it short and sweet since the preacher took my time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that won't stop me. <laughs> well, wasn't the singing great tonight? I enjoyed every song we sang tonight. And uh, I'm glad you're here. Courtney's back. Courtney let a little thing like kidney stone get in there. Yeah. Listen, listen, I've had them. That's why I can say that. I don't wish that on anybody. I really don't. Well, we're glad you're here tonight. We're going to look uh, in a matter of uh, our stewardship. We have been talking about stewardship. Janet uh, talked about stewardship of our time. That all of us have the same amount of time in a given uh, day week, a month, a year, and uh, God commends us or commands us as well to redeem the time, that is to use our time wisely. I remember hearing a story about uh, Grandma and Grandpa laying in bed one night and they had a, a uh, grandfather clock and it struck 13 times. <laughs> she said, Paul, what time is it? He says, it's later than it's ever been. <laughs> <laughs> now 
<laughs> Folks, uh, in regard to our time, it is later than seven. That's right. Jesus said, I must work the works of Him who sent me, for the night is coming when no man can work. Then last week, Jerry uh, uh, taught us about the stewardship, management of our, our matter, matter of our talents, that is, our natural abilities that God gives us, and then also of our spiritual gifts that He gives us when we uh, come to know Christ and uh, be saved at the moment. Uh, we come to Christ, the Holy Spirit baptizes us in the body of Christ and in Christ, and we receive at least one spiritual gift. And uh, uh, it, it is a sad thing that uh, some folks would go through all through life and their spiritual walk with Christ and never seek to know what their spiritual gift is. That's uh, our responsibility to know what God has uh, gifted us to do and then uh, put it to work in the in the uh, local church. Now tonight, I want to start off this way. I want you to finish this sentence for me. Okay? It's not a trick sentence. Completed. I would go to church, but every time I go, the preacher preaches on money. money. <laughs> Anybody ever heard that? I'd go to church, but every time I go, the preacher preaches on money. Well, it might be that the time they go, he might preach on them. And, uh, yet, uh, I know that John Rollins, who was a pastor of a large church up in Cincinnati, Ohio for years, he said he had a good comeback for that. Every time he goes to the grocery store, they ask him for money. Every time he goes to the ball game, they ask him for money. Every time he goes to the doctor, he, they ask him for money. So there's no getting around it. A uh, matter that uh, they say love makes the world go around, but money greases the wheel. And it takes money. We all know it takes money. And and uh, uh, I'm just the, like the paper boy tonight. I'm just going to deliver it. And you don't uh, uh, stone the paper boy because there's the, the editor writes something that you don't like. So we're going to make it lighthearted. I, I thought we'd make it a little bit of fun tonight, some of the things I'll say. Uh, because I think most of us have been in church long enough to know what our responsibilities are in, in regards to, uh, to money. But you know, the Bible has much to say on that subject, on the matter of finances. In fact, of 38 recorded parables by Jesus, 16 deal with our use of our finances. One out of every 10 verses in the Gospels deal with personal finances. And then there are approximately 500 verses about faith, but there's 2,000 verses verses rather uh, about our possessions. So you read the Scriptures, you read the Bible, and as you get into it, you see that God is concerned about our uh, treasure, what we call our finances. Uh, when we talk about the stewardship of our finances, there's much to be said about it, but we're going to just uh, confine our study to that which uh, is on tithing and on giving offerings. When it comes to our finances, our stewardship, what do we say stewardship is? All right now. Yes. Go ahead, Drew. Jerry, it's your birthday. Get, yeah, give us the answer. It's just, just, it's just taking care of those things that we've been entrusted with. It, it's taking care of those That's things that, that God has entrusted us with. And so uh, it is our responsibility. In fact, uh, God asked us an important question. You've read these verses. Uh, you've, uh, we've heard them preached on. We heard them taught on many times, but it's worth going over and, and reading them again. If you would, turn in the book of Malachi, chapter 3, and uh, verse 7, and we'll read through the 12th verse. Everybody hear me all right? Yeah. If I get too loud, just wave or something. Malachi, chapter 3. From the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and not have and have not kept them. And God says, Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. And here's their answer. But you said, In what way shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, In what way have we robbed you? 
in tithes and in offerings. Then God says, You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. And then he, he commands him, He says, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me this, try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you such a blessing that there be not enough room to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that it will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine <coughs> fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord. You would think that as long as people have been in the church and in, in Sunday school and Bible study, uh, that uh, when it comes to tithing, it wouldn't be a problem. Now, I don't know anything about the finances here. I haven't talked to Barbara and say, Barbara, tell me uh, on average how many in our church tithe. I wouldn't do that by any means. But, but research has found that as Christians today, we're only given about two and a half percent of our income, as compared to during the Great Depression, people gave on average of 3.3 percent. During the Great Depression, they gave 3.3 percent. On average today, Christians are given about two and a half percent. And all this time that we look around and we see uh, all the abundance of things we have, the luxuries we have. Uh, the, all the good things that we have and people are giving less money. It says also in research that only 3 to 5% of Americans who give to their local church do so through tithe. And it said when surveyed, only 17% of Americans said they regularly tithe. 17% of Americans say they regularly tithe. Now I'm going to open this up for discussion. I want some answers. We're going to have some fun with it, okay? Don't be serious about it. But why do you think people don't tithe? Why, why is that such a struggle for some people? Why do you think they don't tithe, Jerry? Because they incur so much debt. Yeah. They incur so much debt. Yeah. Uh, I have two great... Uh, Bumper stickers I, I like. I like my first one is live your life so that when you die the preacher won't have to lie at the funeral. That's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> my second favorite one is I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. <laughs> and that and it's it. People incurring so much debt that when they add their month up, they got more month than they have money. That's right. And so if they're gonna shortchange anyone, it won't be Sears, or not Sears, maybe, or won't be the credit card company. They're shortchange God and His work at His house. Why? What are some other reasons why people may not tithe? I think. Uh, Go ahead, Barb. No, I just think that people, Christians, have not learned yet that they can trust in the Lord enough that He's going to take care of our needs. Mm -hmm. We just we just hold back because we're so afraid that we've got to be take care of ourselves on our own and not trust Him. That's good. Take care. So it's a lack of faith? Yeah. And so when there's a lack of faith, <clears throat> there's fear. Right? I believe, Harry, do you have your hand raised? No? no. I saw it. I saw some moving over there, but I maybe so it's you <laughs> why, why else would maybe someone not die? They think, they think they can't afford to. They, they can't think they can't afford to? They look at it, and their debt is high, and uh, so they think, I can't afford to. Uh, I found out a long time ago I can't afford not to. <laughs> Anybody else? Any other reasons? Sometimes the preacher, um, they think that the preacher or the church don't use the money like they use. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah that's true. Problems up. All right. The man that we ran into, and he said, "Look at what all I have. This is all mine." Yeah. Remember him? Yeah. Let me ask you this: Have you met anybody that was just plain out stingy? <laughs> <laughs> I have. Stingy. 
And so, if they weren't generous in, in other ways, they certainly weren't going to be generous to, at God's house and with the tithes, right? And so, people can come up with numerous reasons why they don't tithe. Uh, I've had them on before, I'll be honest with you. I, as a young Christian, I struggled with tithing. I, I was like Barbara was saying, I just couldn't, I didn't seem to have the faith it would take to see how to tithe. I, I had uh, children, I had family to feed, and had all these other expenses that, that were there, and it just looked like an impossibility. You know, I thought I was a good accountant, but I found out I was no accountant on that one. So, so it's a matter of uh, our perspective. So, and I wrote down some thoughts on tithing, and, and this is my thoughts. Uh, when it comes to tithing, we'll look at the fairness of it. What does God require? What does the word tithe mean? 10%. 10%. Don't you think that's fair? There's 90% left over over here. And he says, bring your tithe in, which is 10%, and, and, it's, and it's fair. It's, it's, it, it says the same thing to the person who may have a lot of money. They tithe on their 10%. A person who is maybe upper middle income, they give their 10%. A person who may be on their lower income would give their 10%. And even a person that we might would call impoverished would give their 10%. The fairness of God. You know, uh, <laughs> this get on political, but maybe this is where... Uh, the fair tax came to mind, you know? <laughs> that, that God says, all that I ask of you in this regard is to bring your tithe into the storehouse that my house may be full. Bring your 10%. It's, it's fair. And secondly, we don't give to enrich God because He owns it all. The, uh, the psalmist said in Psalm 24, Verse 1, I believe, Jerry, you quoted this verse last week. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof is His. Psalm 15, verse 10, He says, For every beast of the forest is mine. The cattle on a thousand hills is mine. Is mine. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all it contains. He says, All the gold is His, all the silver is His. That everything is His to begin with. And we talked about stewardship, that we're managers of that which He gives us. And when it comes to our treasure, or the things that God has given us as well, we're, they're on loan to us, and it's a management uh, that we're involved in, taking care of those things that truly belong to Him. Now in our text in Malachi, the Lord says this, that we're to try Him. I like the King James Version where it says, Prove me. Put the Lord to a test. You know, it's the only place in Scripture that God challenges us to put Him to the test. Put Him there and see. I would challenge anybody as far as a young believer in Christ, now that I'm older, now that I'm looking back with experience, now that I know better, now that I'm, I'm, I've grown, I would challenge any person who is uh, just a new believer, Put the Lord to the test. See what He'll do for you. And because He has promised to meet all of our needs, He says prove Him now. There's two things, that uh, fundamental basic things that tithing does for us. It is one way for us to learn the faithfulness of God. When you give your tithe, for instance, maybe you, you're short that way. Maybe you do have more month than you have money. Maybe there are more outcome than there is income. And it comes time to give your tithe, and you say, Lord, I don't know how. I don't know what I'm going to do. These bills need to be paid. And yet you want to be faithful, and you want to obey God, and you put it there, and you place it in, in the offering basket, or, or ever how the offering's taken, the tithe is taken, and then in so doing, you learn to trust God. The faithfulness of God. And sometimes that's the only way that we can learn the faithfulness of God is by obeying God and leaving all the consequences to Him as Dr. Stanley say. So we learn to trust God. And uh, so and another way 
is tithing is God's way to meet the needs of the local church. You know, as just as He commanded uh, the tithe to be brought into the storehouse, which is Old Testament in the Old Testament, and was a, it was the tabernacle laid in the temple. The storehouse today is the local church. I believe that God commands us to bring our tithe and to support the local church. That's how this church functions. That's how this church does what it does in Monroe and, and the state and around the world. It's through the giving of, of tithes and offerings. So uh, we are commanded to do so. So it, it gives us an opportunity. Everything that you and I can see this church does, if we're faithful in giving, if we're faithful in tithing, we don't have to say it out loud. We can just say it to yourself. I had a part in it. I have a part in it. And then when the day when the rewards are heaven, in heaven are given out, God says, you have a part in it. You had a part in it. And, and the joy of, uh, of it all is knowing what is being done on any given Sunday or throughout any given week the, of the influence that this church has uh, in Monroe and in, in the state of Georgia and around the other, other places and around the world through giving and missions. The influence it's had. What, who would have thought that this little church, and I, and I use that word little in sense, put it in quotes, that this little church in Monroe, Georgia would have such great influence? So give yourself an amen. Okay. All right, so we, we learn those things and through giving because tithing uh, is a wonderful thing. And so uh, uh, I, I thought about this, and I did it just a little bit tongue-in-cheek. You know what tongue-in-cheek means, okay? <laughs> about uh, about uh, three basic motivations for tithing. Now, we're commanded to tithe, okay? That's the command. God says to bring, our bring the tithe in the storehouse. That is command. Uh, if our will is surrendered, that command is not a hard thing to do. If our will is surrendered and we're stubborn, we'll become stiff-necked and it's hard to do. But there's three basic motivations I came up with. And first off, they all start with G. Real smart, real brilliant on my half, okay? Some people give out of guilt. You believe that? I do. Uh, some people, like for instance, nobody in this church, because uh, I don't know anybody, but for instance, somebody that comes to church and they hadn't been in church in a while. They miss three or four Sundays. And just like I said before, every time I go to church, the preacher preaches on money. They come to church, and that Sunday, Brother Tommy preaches on tithing, on money. He talks about the matter of tithing. He lays out the principle of why we should tithe and how God blesses us when we tithe. And he just expounds on it. And, and everybody there can understand that we are to tithe. And so the wife and the husband go home after being missed three or four Sundays, okay? I don't know anybody, so don't, don't come up and say, who are you talking about? Because I don't know anybody. They go home. And it's usually the wife after dinner you say, honey, you know, Brother Tommy preached on tithe this morning. Don't you think we all tithe? <laughs> he's kind of lucky. He's not really paying much attention. He's, you know, anyway, and he'll say, yeah, I think we should. And so they come back to church next Sunday. And they're two Sundays in a row they're here. And that Sunday, they write that check out. They write that tithing envelope made out. And they feel good about it because their conscience is getting a little softer about tithing. They, they don't feel as guilty as it were because they don't tithe that Sunday. They put it in the offering plate when it's passed or going out the door as we do now. And they feel good about it. And guess what? The next Sunday, they miss. They come back the next Sunday and they drop it in again. And then it's vacation time. Okay. Now, I, I might be like the old uh, preacher was preaching one time. He was preaching a lot of things. And finally he got on snuff and the little old lady stood up and said, I'm preaching, you done quit preaching, you gone to bed. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> they, go, they come and it's vacation time. And so guess what? They take their tithe with them to Panama City Beach. <laughs> <laughs> and just as the devil would have it, there's a lot of good things to do in Panama City Beach. There's hang gliding. There's uh, 
a lot of good food to eat and a lot of places to go and come back, they ain't got two nickels to rub together. <laughs> and so guilt says sin again because they, they, uh, they give out of guilt. So uh, folks like that need to learn just give out faith and be obedient to God. Okay? And then there are those who, who give out of greed. You mean people give because they're greedy? That don't make sense. Let me explain it to you. For instance, people come to church and Brother Tom expounds on time. He tells the truth about God blesses those that give and he if you give, and you give, and it shall be given unto you, so forth. He'll, he'll quote the scriptures and whatever, and they, they feel good about it. Boy, they, they say, man, we ought to start giving. God will bless us if we start giving. Then they turn on the TV, and they turn on one of the channels, and I won't tell you which channel it is, and they listen to the, uh, the channel, and the preacher gets on there, and, he's, and then he asks somebody to give a big testimony about how that they were broke and how they couldn't make ends meet, and they started tithing, and as soon as they did, they went into work the next morning, they got a raise, doubled up what they made, and they said, well, this, this tithing works, and they heard it from somebody else giving a testimony, and they thought, well, I don't give because it, if we give, God bless. And He does, folks. Don't get, don't get me wrong, He does. But then the same couple that heard it go into work the next Monday, and they get a pink slip. Because the devil wants it that way. They have a flat tire going home. Or they, they get home and all the kids are sick with an earache. And they say, well, it didn't work for me. I tried it. Instead of going forward, I'm going backwards. Let me challenge you this to tell anyone we give not out of grief. We don't give out of guilt. But we give out of grace. That's right. Here's what I found in my own life, folks. When I fell in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, when I truly <laughs> fell in love with the Lord Jesus Christ, when I love Him more than life itself, when I write that tithing check and it goes in the basket, it just says, Lord, I love you. Lord, you've done so much for me. How could I ever done, withhold something that, that as small and insignificant as 10% of that which you've given me? And it's just love. You know, the Bible says that Jesus was, though He was rich, He became poor for us that we through Him might become rich in Him. Amen. He lived up all of glory, came down to this earth, lived the life that He lived, suffered the way that He suffered, went to the cross and died for us. How much more, how small a thing, how insignificant a thing is to give our tithe for, to, some, to someone and to the work of Christ when He has done so much for us. When you go home tonight and you can lay your head on your pillow and you have peace with God and when you realize that if you were not to take a, a next breath sometime during the night and you died, heaven be your home. How, how can you ever, how can we ever say that we shouldn't give? That's right. When God has been so good to us. The psalmist said, let all the house of Israel say, the Lord has been good to us. I say to us, let every one of us say, the Lord has been good to us. That's right. I, I get up and I, I like Facebook because it, it takes me out of boredom at work sometimes. And, and I look at it and people say, well, uh, uh, how many of you have been blessed this day? I think, I've been blessed because I got out of bed. <laughs> I went to work. I'm, I'm well. I'm healthy. And God has met every need that I had. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19, Our God shall supply every need we have according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's right. Every one of us here can talk about the faithfulness of God. God is faithful. He always keeps His word. God is not a man that He should lie. That's right. Has He not said and will He not do it? 
And so, uh, some folks get a lot of greed. Some folks get a lot of greed out of guilt. But the best way to give is out of grace. The grace of God. We're all unworthy. It was the grace of God that saved every one of us. And every time that we have an opportunity, time to give, we can give because of His grace. And so, uh, we should be faithful in tithing because of grace. Now, I'm a simple person. I like to talk simple. I want to bring it down just like J. Vernon McGee did to the, where the rubber meets the road. You may be here, and I don't know, like I said, I don't know any of his for what you tithe, what you don't tithe, don't care, don't want to know, okay? But you may be here and you might struggle with it. I have at times. There have been times I didn't tithe. I hate to admit that, but I, I have been times I didn't tithe. But way it settled for me when I finally got it all settled in my heart was whose money is it anyway? That's right. <laughs> whose money is it anyway? Right. It's not mine. He's given me some money. He's blessed me with some money. All of it belongs to God. Everything that you and I have belongs to God. He's, it's on loan to us. He's given it to us. He said, well, I went to work and I made my money. Who gave you the health and the strength and the mind to go to work? That's right. Who gave you the job? Maybe you you were smart and you thought you made a good interview. God's in control of everything. He's sovereign over all things. Amen. And so, but James said every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from God. Everything is His. It belongs to Him. You know, the more uh, older I get, the more I realize, and I, I'm sure you're this way because all of us are getting in that age group, <laughs> I realize I'm not going to take anything out of this world. And you're not eating. It's said of Alexander the Great that when he died, he was a young man when he died, comparatively speaking. He had uh, conquered all the places he could conquer. It's said that Alexander said when he uh, died, he, before he died, he requested that he be buried with his hands open like that because he had nothing else to conquer. Maybe it'd be well that we'd ask the funeral director to hold our hands open like that and so others could see we take nothing out of this world. Nothing. They don't do it so much anymore as they, as they used to. When a man died, you'd go over the funeral and you could buy a suit of clothes. Bury him in. One significant thing about that suit that was different than the suit you'd buy in a department store, what was it? Anybody know? No pockets. No pockets. No pockets. <laughs> Because when taking anything with it, I, I walk through the through my garage. We don't have a lot of stuff. We we we're just not. I just never had a lot of stuff. Never been been content much of my life. But I do have a few things. And every time I walk through it, I think that leaf blower over. I gave two hundred dollars that leaf blower. That edge and that uh, that thing cuts trim trim the hedge with. That was a two hundred dollar battery operated. I'm proud of that. I like that. Damn thing. It won't be long after I die. All my kids will be over here. If she and I go close together, and they'll be over there and they'll have a, 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 a garage sale or a safe sale, and they'll sell for 50 cents or, or maybe $150. I don't know. All of it be gone because I can't, you can't, we can't take anything with us. And so the way to settle the matter of giving is to know this all belongs to God. Amen? All right. What time do I need to stop, Bill? I've gotten wound up time to send the alarm call. <laughs> He's going to give me about five minutes to take prayer requests. We okay. Pray. Now that's our tithing. We won't say any more about tithing. Now let's talk about our stewardship of our offering. Some of us consider the stewardship of our treasure has been established in all that He's given us. It's for the purpose of managing it, whether it's our time, whether it's our talent, or our treasure. And there's some misconceptions about tithes and offerings. And one of them is that some group uh, believes that the tithe and offering uh, is the same. And another group speaks of the tithe as the Old Testament principle. 
and lean more to the giving of offering. Listen, I know Brother Tommy well enough. No, you can call it tithe, you can call it an offering. Just put it in there, right? <laughs> right? All right. And so uh, the principle of tithing began in the Old Testament, even before the law. Somebody said, that's Old Testament law. Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek before the law was ever given. And so the principle of tithing is old in the Old Testament. If a person's looking for a principle given in the New Testament, guess what? New Testament believers gave 100% the book of Acts. They sold all that they had and brought it and laid it down to the apostles' feet. Aren't you glad Brother Tommy didn't ask you to do that? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, uh, so in the book of Acts, they sold their possessions to fund the ministry. Now, Paul in 2 Corinthians talks about the Macedonian church. Uh, they gave, and let me read it right quick and that I can hurry it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and verse 8, and 1 through 7. So, more, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now, listen to this that in great trials of affliction, they, they gave when they were having a hard time. Okay? In a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy. In their deep poverty, they didn't have it to give, so to speak. Abounded in the riches to the, of their liberality, for I bear witness that, in, that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. So we urge Titus that he who had begun so he would complete this grace in you as well. But as you abound in everything in faith and speech and knowledge and all diligence and your love for us, see that you abound also in this grace. Paul said these believers gave over and above their tithe. They weren't compelled to give. They gave freely. They gave sacrificially. <coughs> And guess what? God blessed them. Now, uh, they gave, I like this, and I will close with this, okay? They, it says, the scripture says, they first gave themselves to God. And here's what I wrote in my notes, and I found it to be true. When God has your heart, that's the whole being, okay? He has the keys to your bank account. He has your purse strings or your wallet. That's right. They weren't wealthy. You don't have to be wealthy or rich to be generous. Generous to God. Some of the offerings that we take is the Annie Armstrong. In fact, we're doing that right now. Continuing, right? Bill is been, still being taken. Annie Armstrong offering, the Lottie Moon offering, which is around at Christmas time. Building program. There's always a way to give. And you can't out give God. Amen. He's a better accountant than you and I will That's ever right. be. Because he has promised, and he who has promised will fulfill it Amen. until the day of Jesus Christ. That's right. Aren't you glad that you have a part in the work of God through tithing and giving all? Bill, come on. Amen. Thank you very much for that. We need it. Oh, I have. To, I do have one other thing to say. Yes, sir. And you know how to kill a Baptist? Yes, yes. Shoot him in his pocketbook. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll buy that one too. We're going to have a prayer request in just a second, so be thinking of those around you that need uh, our prayers.